90 day challenge as you probably already know about as part of this 90 day challenge we are building a end to end devops use case in about 90 days by completing 10 different missions and uh, uh, for every mission we have a live masterclass and then uh, i have given some preparatory work for this uh, this time so those of you who are already our members uh, you might have received uh, the email from me about the preparatory work i had asked you to go through uh, so from this week onward i'll give you some homework that you want to go through and then we come back for the live session i will demonstrate certain things and then you go back and do more projects there as part of the preparatory or the homework i had asked you to go through uh, one particular module on how to build container images what are the docker files uh, how to write docker file what are the instructions in the docker file so i'm assuming that you have already gone through those sessions those of you who are not members i would recommend you to take membership so that you can benefit 100% out of this as well right because we follow a flipped learning model where you go through the courses and the content prepare come prepared and here i will demonstrate by building uh, some component of a project that project that we are building is called as craftista this is a, a craft mega store you can call it or you can think of it as a e-commerce platform as well and i uh, have designed this as a ultimate learning app which uses some of the you know the top uh, most popular microservices stack the most relevant for all of you and you can see this is the architecture of our service application stack what you see here is the front end behind this there are three different services you can see each the status of each of that service uh, there is a catalog service the catalog service shows this these components we have uh, uh, the recommendation engine recommendations sh engine shows us the origami of the day and there's a voting service as well so if you click on the votes it generally goes and submits it to the backend service if the backend service is also available and that is about this application simplistic application but you can think of it as an e-commerce platform as well because when you say catalog it can be any product catalog the recommendation service is typically available in most of the platforms and uh, we have just have a simplistic implementation of it and the review service is also typically available on most of the platform so think of it as one of those uh, e-commerce platforms and you can look at the architecture we are using the modern technology front end for the node uh, express js for the front end uh, catalog is written in flask python uh, voting application is written in spring boot so it's a java application uses maven as a build tool and the recommendation engine is the golang now when we talk about this end to end devops use case we are also doing a container based delivery here primarily uh, so we started with docker last week we are talking about how to package our application using container images this week and then we're going to continue with that journey and talk about uh, uh, implementing branching models with git uh, build continuous integration pipelines with uh, jenkins uh, cloud auto scaling terraform uh, will deploy it with kubernetes uh, set up automated deployments using argo and finally we set up monetization so this is a 10 week session and every week we will take up a new mission here so what is the mission of the week the mission for the week for us is to containerize these application stack uh, this application stack with mainly four services front end catalog voting and recommendation as part of today's live session i will demonstrate to you how to uh, let's say build or package the front end which is written in node.js and the golang application which is written in uh, recommendation application which is written in golang and when we do that i would also talk about some of the best practices how to write a docker file how to build a container images using two different approaches how to write a docker file what are the key instructions and how you can optimize it what are the best practices that you could possibly use as well so uh, let's start with one of the application that is the front end application which is written in node js you can see the code here this is the repository the very same is the repository and we call it a mono repository what we call this is a mono repository and uh, um, you know we have uh, different services in as part of that same repository that's why it is called as a mono repo catalog front end recommendation and voting and i will start with the front end app which is written in node js it is basically a express js app so it's a node js based framework and how do we build a node js application typically remains same whether you use express js whether you use uh, vue js whether you use nest js 
uh, you know, more or less it remains similar. Uh, there are certain variations sometimes, but more or less it remains similar. And when you go through this project and complete it, uh, you know, you can follow, uh, you will have access to the recording here, uh, this recording. So you can, you know, later try out on your own and then you can take remaining applications. I will have the instructions written the same way and you can complete that as a project as well for this week. That's what I would suggest. Uh, so let's get started with it. Uh, before we get started, a bit about context. Um, so this session will be approximately 90 minutes, more or less. And you can start posting your questions in the chat. You can use a Q&A section out there. Uh, so feel free to start adding your questions in the chat or in the Q&A. And I will get to the question as and when I can, right? But I'll start explaining things. And while I'm explaining things, I may not be able to look at your questions, etc. But uh, I'll definitely try to answer them as uh, soon as I can. Uh, very important announcement is this is record this recording will be available to you we generally post it on the youtube channel and uh, i've started being more active on instagram and uh, uh, you know linkedin as well but we post a recording on the youtube channel as well and you will have access to it even later so you can watch it later so i generally get this question about recording so i'm just answering it in advance now let's uh, um, start posting your questions by the way uh, you can post it anytime. I'll look into it as and uh, when I can. Okay, so let's start with this application front end. Now, how do we typically go about building a container image? So what is the best way of building a container image? Anyone, you can put it in the chat. How do you build a container image? You can put it in the chat. What is the best way to go about it? Have you ever, uh, how many of you have built a container image before? Docker file, yes, Suraj. How many of you built a Docker container image? You can say one if you have, zero if you have never written a Docker file or never have built a container image. Uh, just mention one or zero. Yeah, Docker file, Docker file is the best way to do that. And even with the Docker file, there are certain concepts which you, if you implement, uh, you can create a really optimal, tiny, secure, uh, version of a container image as well, right? And uh, I see some of you have uh, uh, created, um, you know, Docker file and using from a base image, of course. So um, that's always there, Dibya. So we use base image, but it's ultimately goes as part of a Docker file. And uh, that's how the image layers are also created. So many of you have already created a Docker file, which is a great thing to know. Uh, I'm just showing you my approach then. And I'll show you how I would optimize a container image and uh, what are the things that I would consider when we want to do that. I'll start conversing with you as well. Uh, Multi-stage Docker file Sai is a, a great way to optimize the image. We'll get to that uh, after, after a little bit of uh, time. So let's begin with the basics. How to build a container image? We'll start with the front-end application. Now, my approach is if I do not know how uh, to build or create a container image and write a docker file uh, because docker file is a way to automate your image builds and docker file is has a code uh, to do that right but right before writing the docker file you need to understand how what to write in that docker file right what is the procedure it is the procedure that you take and then you convert it into code if you do not know about the procedure it is good to start with that a procedural approach and then you think about automating it so that's the way i follow generally now what what do you mean by procedural approach let's say i want to build a vm image how do i go about it with a vm image i would typically start with a you know a vm install everything inside that and then take a snapshot of that to create an image basically that's how i uh, go about it so that's the approach I'm going to follow here as well. Uh, so what will be my approach? I will start by cloning the code first onto my system. So by, I need access to my source code, right? That's what I'm packaging. What are we packaging? We are taking the source code, converting into a binary and the runtime, and we're packaging that. So we take the source code, we create an environment. Environment as in we create a dev container here, right? And uh, now this is where what kind of base image to use is a question. 
So one approach is to start with a vanilla version of Ubuntu, CentOS, Debian, whatever it is, and then launch your container and then install the build tools because you need some tools to build your application. For example, for Node application, we need Node.js, we need NPM. For Golang application, we need the Golang Go compiler, right? For Java application, we need Maven. So either you start with the base, which is vanilla version, or you have an image which already has the build tools available, right? Now, I follow the second approach. Uh, I believe uh, Dibya mentioned about the base image and uh, what kind of base image is what we are talking about. A base image, ideally, if it contains your build tools like Maven, Go, Node and NPM, it saves your time, it makes your job easier and your code also becomes simpler. So that's what I would typically recommend. You have a base image and then you copy the source code, then you compile it, build it, whatever it needs to be done, test run it, and then once it is done, you take a snapshot of it. This is the very same procedure that I'm gonna follow here, starting by cloning the code first onto my workstation where Docker is installed. So this is where my source code is. Let me take this. And uh, clone it. Yeah, my code is here. And not only this, so I have a subdirectory for my application called as frontend. So I will switch to that subdirectory frontend from here. This is where my Node.js application resides. And then I would start uh, uh, creating an environment where I have the build tools that includes Node and NPM. Now, how do I go about it? Where do I take this image from? Uh, where does the image come from? You can mention it in the chat. Um, and uh, what is a good example of that? It's a registry and there are many different registries. You typically we use the image from the Docker hub, hub.docker.com that is, right? And let's say I want to build an image uh, for Node.js application. So what I typically would do is go and look up an image which already contains Node, NPM, and all the uh, stuff which is required, right? So let's say Node here. Now, what kind of image that you choose can make a difference, right? So I see different versions of Node.js, that's one. There is a version 21 of Node.js, there is version 20 of Node.js, there is version 18 of Node.js, and then there is a bullseye, there is a bookwork slim, uh, there is an alpine. Uh, what is the difference? Anyone? And which one should we pick? I see 21 bullseye. Uh, let's say we pick 20. So we have 20 alpine, 20 bookworm, 20 slim, 20 with bullseye, 20 with buster. If you have to pick one, which one that would be? This is going to have a quite, an, quite a significant impact as well. So what you're going to pick is going to be typically the good idea is if you want to keep your images tiny, small, manageable, secure, uh, small footprint, we use something like Alpine. Uh, why do we use something like Alpine is uh, uh, because we'll see the difference. You look at the image, which is Ubuntu. Right. And Ubuntu has uh, uh, how many, uh, let's say these many tags. And you can see the image is about 25 MB small. Uh, this is the compressed version. So when you uncompress it, it might be like 40 MBs, but it's still small. Uh, let's look at Alpine now. See how much difference it makes. Uh, there is a question from Dibya about, is there a way to know what vulnerabilities we have on the base image before starting with one? Yes, sure. Uh, one is you will see some security checks being done by Docker Hub. And you can also employ um, some image scanning tools if you want, but you can also look at uh, these typically official images are quite, uh, um, you know, uh, they're up to date and Docker makes it a point to make sure it is updated and all that. And Docker has a scanner also, I believe. Uh, I'll try to find out where uh, to look up that. Earlier it used to be 
uh, it used to show that score somewhere here itself. Uh, it may be part of their commercial version now, but it is uh, somewhere there. Now, Alpine, uh, the difference it makes between Alpine and Ubuntu is this much. So you see, it's 10 folds. Yeah, so you can see the vulnerabilities right here. Uh, the report is right here. So if there are any known vulnerabilities, or what kind of a severity it is, uh, you already see it here. And this is about 3 MBs versus this is about, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ubuntu was about 30 MBs or so, right? So still a good amount of difference. So wherever possible, try to use an image, which is, uh, this is the first optimization technique I will give you. Let's say I will use an image, which is 20 Alpine 3.18. Let's stick to this. Yeah. And uh, um, what do I do here is I need to create an environment to build my application with. So I just need a container with node. And so when I install node, it comes with NPM as well. I will show that to you. And what do I do here? I create a container. So docker run hyphen IDT, uh, maybe give it a name. Uh, I will call it as FE. That's my front end. And I will do the port mapping. So one thing which is very important is you must do the port mapping in advance because let's say you built the application and you compiled it, you are running it. How do you test it would depend on whether you have done the port mapping before or not. So port mapping is a concept we talked about last week also. So that's part of containers. How do you expose it and all that? Uh, so port mapping needs to be done in advance. Now, which port uh, that information is given here. So I've given all that information that is relevant for you. For each application, you'll find it here. So node version, anything like 20, 21 is fine. This was tested with 21. We'll see if 10, 20 works also. Build command is npm install. This application would run on 3000. That's how it has been designed. So whatever that port is, I will just expose 3000 on my host to 3000 on the container and uh, launch this container image uh, with something, something to go with that is sh. Uh, Udit asked difference between Alpine and Slim images. Both are smaller. Slim is a Debian version. So it is a version of Debian, uh, whereas Alpine is um, its own operating system. It is based on something called as BusyBox. BusyBox is a very tiny operating system. It has been there for a while and Alpine is based on that. It's a tiny but operational. That's the important part. So here, uh, or what am I missing? Um, I have minus P additional one. And uh, that's it. So what I'm doing now is setting up an environment with node and it may have a uh, uh, node.js and npm both. I will just show you. I will exec into this container which we just created with 15c starting 15c using sh. And once I'm inside the container, once I'm inside the container, it is npm version and node version. You can see node is 20, npm version is 10, but importantly, both tools are available here, right? And now, uh, what do I need? I need the code here. I'm inside the container. I need my code here. I'm going outside and using Docker CP. Uh, this is my step number three to copy over the code. Yeah, and then I would build it by going inside the container. So I'm copying over the code, which is what I'm doing. Docker CP dot two FE. I'll just copy it into directory called as app, right? So you can use any path uh, that you want. The path will get created automatically. And then I go inside the container, Docker exec FE, FE or the container ID, both will work. And then I will land up in uh, or switch to slash app directory. This is where my application is, right? Now I need to build it. Uh, in case of node application, what does it mean by building an application? It is not compiled, but it needs certain dependencies and those dependencies may have other dependencies and uh, so on and so on and so forth. So you need to have all of those installed. Uh, and to do that, uh, you'll find all the instructions right here. So how do you build it depends on the application. How do you build the application npm install in this case? Simple. npm install is going to download all those dependencies, have everything, all the modules uh, which are required to run this application available. And that's what you see here. 
this step varies from application to application. If it is a Java application with Maven, it would be Maven package. Here we have NPM installed. Yeah, and then npm, uh, inst I mean, I see some vulnerabilities here. This is something I can address it, uh, but for the time being, I'm gonna progress because it has installed it and it has uh, uh, executed it, right? So that npm build has done. Now my application will start on port 3000. I have already mapped it. How do I launch the application? Again, this depends on application to application. If it is Java, it may be Java hyphen jar, uh, and xyz.jar for node.js it is like this for some other application it may vary so this command again is specific to your application and then i see that it is running on port 3000 which is what i had mapped earlier and uh, since it has been mapped i should be able to access it on my host Yeah, so it should be able to access it on my host, which is uh, on 3000 port, same port I have exposed from the host and that's it. Now, why do I see just this much and why not everything else like this one is because this is not one application. There are four applications in play here. What you see here is the front end, the front end Node.js and it shows you system information, the version and so on but it doesn't have recommendations. It doesn't have the product catalog that comes from the catalog. This comes from the recommendation and the voting service, the buttons and the votes come from uh, yet another microservice. You see everything being up here, here, not everything is up. And that is a difference and that's fine. At least we see the minimal UI and we know that the front end is up and then you step-by-step, step, you can add more services. As you add more services, the status starts turning to green. Right? That's how this application has been designed. That's why I call it as an ultimate learning app because for learning, this is very useful to see the feedback and not to have a broken code. So I just brought up a front end. It's not working because you know, nothing else is there. It doesn't, it's not like that. Even with the front end, you still see system information. You also see whether it is running in a container. Yes. Whether it is running as a Kubernetes, no uh, IP address, host name. So if you're doing load balancing, you can figure out as well. You can see the version when you're doing rollouts, you can see the versions also on the right. So you have everything that you need and a working kind of a one microservice uh, here. So this is front end. Now this works. Now, once I understand this process, I did this because I wanted to understand the process. I built it, I'm test run, testing it. And now once this is done, I can possibly commit this into an image as well. So there are two different ways of building a container image. One of that is by taking an existing container, which is what I have here. I'll stop the application, come out of the application uh, container. This is the container which is running. Uh, you see this one, that's the one I have. And then I can take this container whose name is Effie and commit it into an image. So Docker container commit, take this container and convert it into an image. I can say, okay, uh, my user ID, typically this is your user ID on uh, uh, Docker Hub. You know, mine is init cron, that's why I'm using that. O user ID organization that you want to commit it to. When the commit happens, it's not validating, but if you try to push it, publish it later, it will. So I will say this is my craftista, that's my application name, slash uh, uh, or hyphen front end, and this is my version one. I'm committing the changes I've made to this container into that image. That's what this means. And I have my very first version of the image, which is about 195 MBs. Now, while this is okay, and we'll see the difference between this and the Docker file one, uh, typically what you should be doing is taking this procedure and instead of doing it this way, because this is not repeatable, for this to work, you'll have to share the instructions and every time you have to build, you have to follow the instructions. This is a manual process or an imperative approach as we call it, versus what we prefer with DevOps is a declarative approach with the code and with the automation. So what we want is convert this into Docker file and then once that happens, we will 
feed it to a Docker image build process. So in goes the Docker file, out comes the image, right? That's the process we want to follow. Now, how to write this Docker file? Uh, that's why I've asked you to go through the instructions. I'm not going to go through each and every instructions, but I will basically convert this and show you this procedure that I followed. Whatever the procedure that I followed, step one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever it was. Uh, and as part of this build, whatever I did, I'm going to convert it into uh, the code now. How does it look like? So let me start writing a Docker file from scratch. So typically we start from a base image. So the very first instruction is from, right? And in this case, whatever the base image that I used, I'm just going to use the same. So if, I, if you remember, I used this node 20 Alpine 18. Uh, I'm going to take the same and uh, add it to the Docker file. It is good to be specific with the tag and not use latest. That's the best practice because latest is no, it's like a latest fashion, right? The fashion keeps changing. Um, you know, things keep changing. Uh, here, we want to be very specific so that it doesn't break in the middle of the night somewhere. And uh, that's why we keep it this way. So how do we add, what, so what should be the next instruction in the Docker file? We have from, which is the base image, which defines the base. Let me walk you through the instructions for those of you who are completely new. So typically these are, uh, this is the syntax that we follow, instruction followed by the argument. Instruction is, convention is to write this in capitals. This is in arguments in small, small letters. That is the convention, okay? Now, uh, next is typically the work directory, that's right. Now, what does work directory do? So we've talked about from, it's the base image. Uh, that's what is used for everything else. Then comes the work directory in our case. Work directory will define where to run everything else from. And that's the reason why you don't have to worry about uh, changing the directory. CD business is not there because we don't have to worry about it. It's just taken care by the work directory itself. So we define the work directory. Uh, it could be anything. So I can say build or app or something like that, right? In, in earlier case, I used slash app. So I'll stick to that. Typically, once I have work directory, I would want to copy my code. What is this copy dot dot business? What is dot and dot? Uh, you know, this is work directory here. The first dot is the build context. What is the build context? Build context is nothing but when you provide the Docker image build and the path, uh, the current path, the path where the Docker file is typically, that path is your build context. It's not a mandatory thing, but that's typically what you will see. So everything in the current path, meaning we are trying to copy the source code. So whatever I did here um, with this, copy the source code. How do I get the source code inside the container? This is how I do it using the uh, copy instruction, copy dot and dot. Then comes typically the run instruction. Now we have a very simple logic here. And uh, in our case, the build happens with, we've looked at it earlier, but let's have a look at it again, npm install, that's it. So we just have to run npm install as part of run. Sometimes run is uh, more than one instruction. Remember the layering concept, uh, I have already explained in the course as well how to optimize the run instructions because every instruction creates a layer. I will talk about that next. And you have to be mindful about how many layers you're creating. And that also has an impact on the size of the image. So be mindful about the layering concept. And accordingly, whatever you need to do during the build time, that goes as part of run. In this case, run npm install. Now, the next instruction is typically, uh, you can also use the add, but what is the difference between copy and add? Shikha, Shikha mentions copy or add. Perfect. Uh, so what is the difference between copy and add? Anyone knows about it? If yes, put it in the chat. Both can be used to copy stuff inside the container, yes.
So here is the difference, two differences between copy and add. Let me turn off my camera. Yeah. So difference is this, uh, this much, you know, with, uh, okay. There's a good, uh, download the file. Yes. Shikha says download a file and unzip also. Yes. So, uh, add performs additional function. Perfect. So you're absolutely right. Shikha and Sai, and uh, it does two things. One is, uh, when it copies with add, you can define a remote source, like you know, you know, copying a file from Jenkins or somewhere else. Uh, you can define that. And secondly, if it is an archive like tar G A G Z zip or whatever, it will extract at the destination. So. Uh, what is recommended is typically using copy uh, because copy doesn't require you from security point of view. It is better because copy doesn't require you to uh, go outside of the container or the workstation. So it is all right there. So that is the difference. So typically we use copy, not add wherever possible. And unless there is a remote source, add doesn't make sense either. Uh, expose, we have defined the port number 3000 straightforward. Uh, can okay my question is i want to launch this on port 4000 on the host i want to define the port mapping like this is this correct or not yes or no one or zero will you give this a one one mark or a zero can this work come on you should know this least some of you so this is not correct sometimes you see multiple ports like this right uh, this means you are exposing multiple ports like a good example is ATN443 for a web application right uh, so that is fine because you're gonna expose multiple ports and your application listens on dif those different ports which is fine but you can't define a port mapping here if you have to define a port mapping uh, you have to define it in the docker compose file Right, that's where it goes. Or you do it during the run instruction, which is fine. 3000 port here, and then we have CMD. CMD defines uh, NPM, or in this case, node app.js. Why? Because that's where my application is, node app.js. That's it. Uh, that's how I built it earlier. So I just converted, if you really realize, I just converted that procedural approach into, into this code and I have these instructions from defines my base, work directory, copy, run, expose and uh, cmd the command to run command is the actual application that is run at the launch time run build time command launch time when you launch the application uh, the port can be defined in various ways we have three different ways of port mapping we've talked about that already and now that i have a docker file i use this docker image build to automate this process so in goes my docker file out comes the image uh, and it's very interesting how it builds that image that's um, the interesting part so docker image build hyphen t and then i provide my user id this would be your docker hub user id typically the application name craftist uh, hyphen frontend colon v2 uh, and the build context copy copies from this build context. Remember that that's my build context. You will see the build context being copied two bytes. That's it because that's how my code is, how large my code is. Uh, not two KBs should be somewhere in two KBs or something like that. Maybe. So this is how much, uh, uh, the build context is. This is the build context, whatever you define here and the code gets copied from there and it is building. Now it's running NPM install. Followed by that, it will uh, run, um, you know, add all the instructions, the layers, and it will be ready to run. Now, if I look at the image that I created manually earlier, uh, let me show you just two. Mm, all right, just look at this. V1 and V2, in terms of size, it's the same. So what is the difference between this and this? This is the one I created manually. 
This is the one I created with Docker file. If you observe the difference using Docker image history, which is a very useful command, you're gonna see this being V1. And uh, uh, you'll see only one layer versus V2. How many layers do you see that we created? You see this is common. And how many layers we created is one, two, three, four, five. Uh, where did this come from? This comes from the Docker file. And that's why Docker file is important. When you see five layers, you can guess how many layers, uh, how many instructions in the Docker file, it would be six. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Six instructions convert into five layers. You can see everything except for from converts into instruction, work directory, copy, run, expose, CMD. Uh, how these instructions, how the layers are created. If you're curious to know about that, here is the secret behind the layering. It's a very interesting concept. So it is about the Docker file, how the Docker file gets executed. Because if you remember, uh, when I created this manually, I only created one container and committed only once. Now with Docker file, this is how it works. So let's say we have instructions in the Docker file from bug directory, copy, run, CMD. And this is what it is. And we start with from, that's the base image. We have, let's say four layers in a base image. Let's imagine that. And then we launch a container with it, right? So uh, what happens is, it launches the intermediate container using the from, the base image, right? It created this intermediate container and then it starts executing each of this instruction, work directory, copy, run, CMD. Uh, so this is what happened. This is very interesting. So here it starts with work directory. Now what happens after commit, I mean, after executing that instruction, work directory, it creates the work directory and all that. After that, what happens is it actually commits it into a new layer and that is how we get the next layer let's imagine we started with four now we have the fifth layer right and then it also deletes this intermediate container that's it right so this is how i got this layer and then it follows the same process then it creates the intermediate container executes the next instruction let's say copy uh, commits it and uh, then we get the new layer here and then it's going to execute run you might have guessed export cmd for every instruction it keeps on executing the same way creating these intermediate containers deleting them and at the end of it once the instructions are exhausted you get your final image that's what is tagged as your in my case v2 that's how the v2 was tagged and that's how you saw these many layers right so this is the secret sauce behind the creation of the layers okay that's how the layers are created in the container image and layering is a very very interesting concept so you have to also be mindful about it so that you're not creating too many layers by writing too many run instructions uh, this can also affect the size of your image so all of those considerations you'll have to make while uh, writing a docker file all right so that's about the way we write the docker file and we build the images and once you have the image you can publish it uh, to the registry. I will do that from here. Now I have a couple of versions of these images and I have already logged into the registry from here. This is the time when I try to use, uh, I will also tag the image. So I'll say docker image tag and I will say my v2 is the latest version. Uh, latest is not automatic, okay? It's not implicit. It has to be explicit and then uh, you'll see it's just a tag or a alias. So we have V2, which is this, and latest, which is this. And then we do Docker image push of, uh, I'll just push the V2 and latest, or V1, V2 latest, let's say. So Docker image push, let's try V2 first. Yeah, it says access to the resource denied because I may have to log in. I have not logged in from here, it looks like. So Docker login is what is gonna help me log into the registry. Registry is Docker Hub in this case. 
how do i know it's in the image right here so if i do not define the registry the default is docker.io login succeeded and now i shall be able to push to the registry yeah and you, you see it pushes layer by layer this is from the base image so it says mounted and then it pushed these many layers and if everything is pushed because v2 has already been pushed latest is just a alias so if i push the latest it's going to do the same same there that's it layer already exists that's what it says and it's been published so if i go to docker hub which is uh, my registry here i should already see it from my profile i will see the registry has been tags have been pushed here v1 and uh, v2 and latest yeah that's how it works uh, this is about 62 mb is compressed see this is compressed on this uh, so you this is a good compression algorithm isn't it because you see 62 mb compressed is 195 mb on the disk so good compression algorithm so when it gets stored uh, it's even smaller than this and it's not duplicate this is just a same image it just has one more entry so that if you delete this you still have latest uh, so but it is just one copy stored in uh, varlib docker and uh, somewhere here you have the overlay fs which are the layers so each of the directory is one of the layers actually that's how it is stored on the disk you know uh, is in the form of that directory with some metadata and the actual data and uh, whatnot now this is about the front end and this is my docker file for the front end this is like i have been able to package my front end application now i'll do the same for golang application which is the recommendation engine so i'm switching to the recommendation which is where my code is and i'll follow the same process but uh, after that i'll show you some advanced concepts also what is the process same process so cloning the code code is already there creating environment copying the code building it test run it and then i'll just go to docker file right away uh, how do i build it this time i'll do it faster because we already know about it i can directly write a docker file as well if i want to uh, in fact let me do that uh, instead of following this process which i know uh, i will start with the build tool and a base image which is uh, from docker hub so I'll go to Docker Hub and search for Golang. I already have it open. And this is the Golang image I want to use. One of this, uh, I'll use the one with Alpine. So I'll be using Golang, colon something, Alpine, maybe Alpine 122. This is Golang version. This is the Alpine version. 3.19 is Alpine version. So let me start writing the uh, Docker file because it is going to be very similar. So you'll typically follow the same scaffold unless there is a very specific requirement so it starts with from uh, you have work directory you have uh, uh, copy we have run instructions we have expose instructions and we have cmd let's start with that and then if needed we can add something else so it's golang this version work directory can be whatever we want let's say build right copy dot and dot Typically, I mean, you can selectively copy as well, uh, but I'm going to start with this now. Run is where we need to think about what is the build tool and how to build this application. Yeah, build tool is Golang, and I would use Go to build this application uh, and create a binary using this. Minus O is output. Output is the binary called as app. So wherever the code is from that directory, if I run this, it should build, compile, create this binary by name app. By the way, with Go application, the binaries are typically uh, statically built, not dynamic. I'll show you what I mean by that. And port is 80. Uh, the way you run it is this. Port is 80. The way you run it is this. So you can say command. This is the bash like, or you can have a more structured like this both are acceptable when it comes to cmd both are acceptable especially with this you can add more arguments like oh this is argument they and then maybe i have minus b i have uh, maybe 
0 colon 0 colon 0 colon 0 colon 80 something like that so you can do it this way as well or you can just have simply slash app both are acceptable since i come from a systems operations world i typically use this uh, if you're a developer most likely you're gonna use or you're gonna prefer using this both both will work okay so this is my docker file let's see if this works i'm starting with the base uh, so once you know the procedure and once you are more experienced you can go and write the docker file right away build copy run export cmd whatnot now let's give it a go so i'm gonna give it a go docker image build hyphen t uh, I'm going to say my user name, craft tester, recommendation. I'll just, you know, short, short name is to reco and uh, V1. Uh, this is my first version. Give it a go. It's a, uh, it's a Golang. Yeah. So we're going, giving it a go to the Golang and uh, it copies the code starting to build. Transfer, transfer the context. Now it is building. Go build. So you see a lot of things being compiled and a lot of, you know, as a part of that, a lot of code, a lot of dependencies, maybe build tools and everything, compilers and all are being uh, added here. Right. Now that's going to have impact somewhere. We'll talk about that and we'll see how this can be optimized further. So it's still building. It's downloading a bunch of things. You can see that it's downloading a bunch of dependencies and that's going to take time. That's going to take space. It's being packaged into our image and it has built it and it's exported. I see my image here, version one, Docker image LS shows that. This is about 560 MBs. You can see that already, right? And it's a working image. We can see that Docker, uh, whether it is working or not, we'll see it docker image history we'll find that first layer look at the layers v1 you see it has created the layers uh, uh, all the layers as we wanted it right starting with uh, this one work directory copy the code uh, run expose cmd and now we launch it I can use just IDTP to launch it. It can pick up the port the uh, automatically. And I can see it 32768, 32768. Here, 32768. All right. Okay, I think I'm missing something, which is uh, the port. It has exposed 80 port, so that's not correct. My application may be running. Uh, I missed the port. It's a wrong port because this application should uh, run on 8080. That's what you have to expose. If you expose the wrong one, this is what happens. The application is running, but it's still not being accessible. Because of this, I will show you also what I mean by that docker locks the application is still running okay yeah in the application logs also you can see the application is running on 8080 i have exposed it on 80 that is a problem so i'll rebuild it i have made that change in the docker file and i'm just launching it again that build command Okay, they asked a question, a valid, very valid question, why you see missing layers. Now this is, uh, this goes back to the history of Docker images, how they are created and how the layers are created and how the layers identifiers are generated. Uh, I'll talk about that once this uh, comes up or let's go to another system and talk about that. Uh, what we are talking about is Docker image history. You see these layers. Okay, is this the image? Oh, this is not the image. This is the image, Docker image history. We are talking about uh, 
this missing why it is missing you see the id here but everywhere else is missing here now why this is the case is because earlier this used to have some random hash being generated as the id that is how the layers were named or identified earlier now it is based on the checksum of the image itself so there is no random hash here now when they move to that system where they moved from away from the random hash to the checksum they did not have a way to decide what to mention here so they just left it as missing and it still says missing which is misleading it has an identifier which is just a checksum but in the place of the actual id it just shows missing that is the that is how it has been for a while uh, and it confuses but that's how it is but it's not mi really missing it is just the they don't have a the proper way of deciding what to name there probably and uh, that's how it has been for a while that's the missing part now i've just built rebuild the image i'm gonna relaunch it with v2 this time i show the docker ps 32769 32769 should yeah you see the uh application which has come up and has this api origami of the day this is the api part and we're not just showing you the api but we have a pretty ui created for you so that you can actually see how it uh, looks like and so on right and uh, you have a welcome page at least right so generally the app generally the api services are like this you go to the api service you typically have to call some api like this i have just converted into a pretty looking instead of raw I have a plugin installed uh, for some JSON modifier or, a, you know, it just makes JSON look prettier, uh, but that's how the APIs are. So you make a get or a post request, and this is a get request, and we just see what is the recommendation for the day. Uh, that's what it is. There's some service status here, which is operational. So we have added these features, small features, but useful, uh, because you can use this for your health checks also. So that's what it is. Right, so this is uh, how the application looks like. It has come up, the image has been built. Uh, we have written a working, we have a working Docker file here and I can go and publish that image as well. So Docker image uh, uh, push, Docker image push goes to here, to the registry, right? It's a working one. Uh, now, the only thing that we're gonna talk about here from now is how do we optimize this further? Right, that's where if you already know about Docker, have written Docker file, how do you optimize? Maybe also interesting for you. Okay, I'm just going to address some questions from uh, Suraj. One from Suraj in registry node is package only, or it's uh, inside OS, there is only a uh, node package. Okay, uh, I'm just trying to repeat the question. In registry, node is package only or it's inside OS, there is only node package. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out this question, but uh, if your question is whether we have node inside the image in the registry, yes, so inside the image, we have node, NPM, the operating system, everything is packaged. So we have operating system on top of that, we have node, node.js, and that's what is part of that package that we fetched. Okay, so another question from Abhishek is, uh, can you please explain the difference between run and CMD and add and copy? Add and copy I've already explained. Run and CMD, remember the difference. Uh, run, when is the question? When do you use run instruction and when you use CMD? So, okay, I have it somewhere here. When you're building the image, let's say you're building an image, you're compiling the application. Go, Go is a good example. Uh, we copy the source code and we compile that application. That is part of our build process. So whatever you want to do during the build process, that's part of run instruction. Once you have built an image, now you take that image and launch it into a container. When you launch it into a container, you have to run some application, launch with something, some application that is your run instruction, uh, command instruction, command, CMD, basically. Uh, I think this is more, this is the one. So whatever you want to do during the build time, that is your run. And then you launch or run the container and whatever application you launch there, that's your command process application, which is the CMD. That's the CMD part. That's the difference. 
on what basis cmd set to uh, slash dot slash app uh, the basis for that is simple so if i go inside this container let's say i launch it with uh, bash this image and uh, or maybe sh because this is alpine docker run hyphen it hyphen hyphen r when you're test running it something like this makes sense okay if you want to use port mapping in further you can do that as well but when you're test running it uh, what i mean by that is 8080 80 on the container side should remain constant 8081 80, host side is fine hyphen hyphen rm is to uh, once i'm done with this test i don't need it anymore this container so it will automatically get deleted that's why I use hyphen hyphen rm and hyphen it will allow me to interact directly so why dot app is the path because if you look at this this has already been built i'm in the slash build directory here after running go build you see the minus o output is app. This is the app. This is the binary. Oh, it's uh, the command is not there. That's fine. Uh, but this is the binary. You can see it is being executable. And uh, you, uh, I wanted to show you something else that this binary is not dynamically linked, meaning it does not have any dependency on any libraries or anything else typically you see that right so you have uh, something uh, a lot of times you will see that right so you have some libraries somewhere so you see an application and uh, we don't have a lot of these applications here just trying to see if it depends on anything else so a lot of times when you see ldd shows you the dependent libraries what that means is if you want to run this, you must have these libraries along with it as well. You have to install those only then this will run. In case of Golang, it's statically built, meaning nothing, no dynamic program is statically built. Uh, just launch it. So you launch it like this slash app and access. That's it. So it's running on 8080. I've mapped it to 8081. Uh, so I should see it there. Yeah same application that's where i'm launching it container with name 0c ending 0c uh, that's where i'm in that's where i am 0c that's my container yeah that's what it is okay uh, another question from abhishek a good question is um, so that's the basis of why slash app and that statically built i'll come to that that will have some impact data uh, can we use cmd abhishek says can we use cmd command more than once you possibly can but what happens is only one cmd is on it if you have multiple cmds what happens is it only takes the one on the top of the layer sometimes you'll see that sometimes you'll see that so here you might see it let's take uh, one of our image and look at docker image history now why do you see multiple cmds there's one here mm. There's no one, no, nothing here. Yeah, there's one here at least, at least two of these, right? Sometimes you'll have multiple, right? And the reason for that is you may have used a base image, which is, which came from somewhere. And that base image has a CMD. That's why you see CMD here, CMD here. But at the end of the day, it will only launch one command, one CMD. That's what is going to have honor the one on the top, meaning the one, the most recent one that you added, that's your CMD that's the one which will be honored everything else will be ignored so even if you have multiple cmds it's of no use so typically we have one command per uh, container another question from suraj uh, if it's bash or python script we don't need uh, run cmd is only yes so you don't have to compile if you don't have to install any dependencies for example if you're just a shell script uh, just add it using copy and have a cmd that's what you'll have that's absolutely correct. All right, so that's about uh, the questions which were there. Uh, another question from Pradeep. Uh, what other parameters can we use in Docker file to build the image like from work directory copy? There are many instructions. So for building, I mean, depending on what you're trying to do, right? Uh, if you look at the Docker file instructions, there are many. What are the common ones? Let's talk about that. 
uh, these are the ones you will see very commonly from work directory copy or add you've seen the difference run uh, cmd is added as a metadata entry point is like a, if you want to run something before command you can add entry point env is the environment variable expose defines the port and apart from that maybe user uh, args so if you want to provide any uh, like variables arguments during the build build time arguments as we call it you can provide the uh, build time arguments you can provide environment add label is uh, kind of we don't use it anymore uh, so much or we do uh, but not very commonly there's entry point there's volume uh, there is argument like build time arguments you can define this is very uh, this is something which you can use uh, as well i see that being used a lot of times uh, then user volume so those are some of the arguments that we uh, health checks those are the ones which we add to the docker file apart from these uh, being, being the most common ones all right now coming back to the image size docker image ls uh, i see the image that i created for the golang application how large is it it's 560 mbs now how can we start optimizing it let's think about that and let's think about what are the things which are present in that image final image right now which we can get rid of so can you come up with at least two things that is not needed in the final image but it is still there right now maybe we can get rid of that maybe we can optimize it that way anyone there are at least two things in this image which probably shouldn't be there at all what's there how do we optimize that right think about it we let's talk about that golang application this is the let's let me show you the docker file you look at the docker file and you'll figure out that yeah we have some things which we have it there but we probably do not need it what is it i can see two things at least and uh, something else to optimize as well all right let's talk about that so what do we have right now and what we do need what we do not need uh let's talk about that so current docker file is building our application let's talk about that golang application uh one thing is uh, okay do we need expose direct explicitly yes expose is needed explicitly because uh that is how we mention or um educate the users about what port my application is going to listen on i mean it does take there are some automation there and <clears throat> tries to pick up the port but it's always good to have that expose explicitly <clears throat> so one suggestion from suraj is yes we can copy the specific folder <clears throat> sure the base image is need i mean some base is needed may not be the base we want right now which has build tools so if you look at the base image yes it can change and it should change because we have build tools that are being fetched which are not needed and this base itself let's see if it is there if not we can pull it <clears throat> go lang and the uh, docker image pull uh, i see that it's there and now you can see it's uh, this itself is about 230 mbs right so out of 560 mb yeah half of that at least yeah uh, 
a little less than half but um yeah this adds up uh, something we don't need this much of a this large of a base image and the reason why this is so large is because we have all of this here so we have you know co from copy run cmd and as a result of that when we look at the image we have the base image on top of that we have the build tools like golang and everything else we have the source code we have uh, uh, the runtime runtime is the actual uh, dependencies libraries anything which is needed in this case golang doesn't need much that's when i said it's a statically built so just deploy it copy it and run it in the same operating system it will work and the application itself now what do we need we must need the application the whole reason why building this image is because we're packaging the application we need the runtime but do we need the source code of course not we don't need the source code in the final image but we are adding it so this is where uh, when you know uh, suraj mentioned we can copy specific folder yes we, that's one option but we don't need the source code at all right and uh, uh, that shouldn't be part of the final image at all the build tools golang and stuff shouldn't be part of it at all right and then how do we get rid of it is where we bring in the concept of multi stage docker file uh if you have even used or seen multi stage docker file type in one if you have not you can type in zero yes or no one or zero i'll show you an example of multi stage docker file uh this is one i will show you an example of a java application here yeah this is a multi stage docker file uh, how do you identify it very simple if you see two from instruction multiple from instruction basically more than one from instruction this is a multi stage docker file from the first from instruction to the next one that's the that's one stage implicitly this is automatically this is stage number 0 this is stage number 1 you can name them as well here i have named it as build and as run this probably doesn't even need a uh, uh, you know like a name itself it's not mandatory this does definitely needs one and why multi stage docker file what does it uh, how does it help us right now what are we doing here is basically uh, we start with the build stage where we have the build tools right and then this is where we copy the source code this is where we compile the application generate the artifact the binary and this image then is discarded later so this is only used for building and then we start with a fresh stage with a new image so now we start a new container with new image a fresh image maybe same image but a fresh container always and then we explicitly copy certain files like from build from build is what uh, we're copying one file sysfo.war so whatever we are generating inside this that war file we are copying it to web apps directory and when we run this it will automatically launch it so essentially what we have here and what we are trying to do is just package what we need so we are excluding what we don't need source code build tools a larger base image for building all of that is gone and now we have like from copy run from copy run cmd etc so we do docker build and we have build tools we have the source code we have the app and uh, then we only copy what we need so here we have a runtime or whatever we need maybe just a simple linux environment is enough for golang just we take that and then we add the application in this case that the app file that one file and we launch it that's it that's my final image that's all i do right and this way we are getting rid of so this is untagged this will be deleted whatever happened during the first stage gets doesn't make it in the final image this is a independent image this will get cleaned up later this gets added to the cache but it gets cleaned up later and this is the only thing that you package so we are just packaging what we need app and the runtime maybe libraries and how do we run it and that's it all right so that's how we do it right now this is what i want to do here as well for something like this so you can see that so you start with maven 
build the application, generate a jar file, just uh, package it with Tomcat. Now, here, what are we doing? So we have a Docker file. I want to convert this into multi-stage. So what do I start with? I start naming my first stage as something. I'll call it as builder. Okay. Work directory, copy, go, uh, run, fine so far. Now this I need in the final image only. So I start another stage here called as from, starting with from. And what do we start with? Just Alpine may be enough. Alpine 3.9 will be uh, fine. So I can just pull Alpine. Uh, maybe same version of operating system is a good idea. So 319 uh, is what I'm going to use as a tag, 3.19 as, as a tag. This is an Alpine image, okay? So I'll just say Alpine 3.19. This is my runtime. In this case, this is a sufficient runtime. And then we just copy one file that is uh, app, whatever is being built from this path and we should be done. So I'll have a work directory here so that when I run CMD, it runs from the work directory itself. In my case, the work directory slash run. And then I'm going to say copy, copy hyphen hyphen from uh, builder. That's the name of the stage. It, I could have used hyphen zero as well. So builder, I'm using a reference. And what am I copying? I, I have to provide an absolute path, like the entire path slash uh, build yeah this could have been slash build also and then I want to define what uh, slash app to what to my work directory so my sorry my work directory slash run so I just say dot here that's it so what this is doing now is it's copying from the stage and I'll just make it a little cleaner for you to understand this code yeah that's that okay so whatever what are we doing here we're using a different base a fresh image just alpine and we just say copy this app to alpine and then launch it it's a statically built so it will run no problems uh let's build this image this time i'll say v3 and it's my multi-stage build now <clears throat> so using a smaller base image <clears throat> using a multi-stage doc uh, docker file can make a world of a difference. You'll see now. <clears throat> we started with an image worth 560 MBs. Remember that. Now we'll see the difference with the multi-stage. And that would be quite a revelation because now we see the image which is V2 was 560, how much is V3? It's about 22.9. That's how small it is, small it, it is, right? Because it just contains application and the build time, um, just the build runtime and application, that's it, right? And let's see if this runs, if it works or not, right? Because we built it, but is it running? Is it working? Uh, hyphen IDTP, V3. It's running on uh, exited, why it exited. Let's see now. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. I'm, I'm going to check this here uh, and Docker logs. This is strange. Okay. So looks like. Try to see something which may not be there. Okay, going to check on my another system where I built the similar image, and maybe there is something else which is missing which needs to be there for this application to work. 
right? Yeah, I think it's the same with something is missing here. Uh, it's probably some templates. So it's looking for templates, it's not able to find it. Let's see if we can figure it out. Uh, where are the templates? We have templates, we have static. So let's say static, we have templates. And uh, let's copy this and see if that works. So <clears throat> I'm gonna say copy from builder. Static. I believe templates is the path with plural. Let me give this a go. At least two arguments. One was provided. The path where to copy. Yeah, I've eaten the dot and added one more here. So whatever the application requires to run it, we'll have to provide it. That's what I'm trying to add here. <clears throat> In the meanwhile, if there are questions, uh, you can start posting for the questions as well. All right, uh, there's a question from Ramasai, you have to take a membership to uh, get started and log, you know, log into the portal. As part of this uh, webinar series or the masterclass series, uh, we also have a special offer for you. So you can, I'll just launch it for the next 15 minutes, it'll be running. Uh, okay, I need to provide the details of that. So I'll just share the offer details with you in case if you want to start with the membership, you can do that. All right, so for anyone who's joining from India, uh, you can take this offer and we use the Razorpay as a payment gateway. And you can join in the membership. And uh, once you are a member, you can log in and get started accessing it. And for uh, anyone who's joining internationally, you can use the Stripe gateway and you will get the similar offer uh, there as well. So it's uh, either, 9999 INR, uh, the yearly membership, or it's about $179 for uh, the international members using Stripe. All right, so you can take the membership to get started uh, with the access, okay? So uh, Pradeep has a question. As we can see, multi-stage image size is small. So for running the app, do we require Golang image should be present on the server? If you had a dependency on Golang, for launching the application, then it would have been yes as an answer. In this case, I showed you that the application app is built statically. It does not have any requirement apart from this template, which is looking for, but apart from that, no. Uh, so you don't need it. That's the answer. Okay, and I'm gonna run this. Uh, if you had a Python application, uh, you would need Python in it. Node application would most likely need uh, Node to run uh, that as well. So those kind of application, it is mandatory uh, here. It's not, right? And we still are looking for some more, something more, I think. So um, I'll have to figure out all those dependencies. So whatever the templates are, it's not able to find it there or something. So I may have to figure this out, but this is the kind of difference you can definitely make. 
uh, I'll have to just further iterate over it. That's all is needed. But it will definitely be um, somewhere under 25 MBs, I can definitely say it would be, right? So I've added the static uh, templates. Uh, maybe something else is needed. So I will just check on what all is needed and probably work on the Docker file and share it with um, uh, you know you if you're a member. I'll or on along with the YouTube video, I'll just share the link with that as well. Right. So uh, the question from Pradeep I have already answered. And uh, uh, okay, okay. I think I pasted the links in the Q and A, but uh, you can take it from there. The membership part. Cedric has a question. Cedric says, will the requirements be provided by the developer or do we need to figure it out? Uh, depends. So if you do not know, you figure it out. And if you know about building applications, like if you have built Node.js, a Java application, a Python application, a Golang application once, uh, the process is more or less similar, okay? Now, if there are any changes, talk to the developer and find out how this is. Uh, that is the reason I've given the instructions here. So I've given you the instructions and uh, here I've mentioned that, oh, uh, you use node, use, this is the build command, this is the launch command, this is the port it runs on. If you're not, if you're not aware, uh, test run it, that will give you an idea, but most likely you will be able to figure out and it's not that kind, I mean, it's not a rocket science really. Uh, once you get used to creating few images, you will definitely figure out. Right, and when you use this, or I'm gonna add a description of the project by tomorrow or so. I was just busy today, but uh, tomorrow or so I'll probably I'll add a description of this. So when you uh, look at the challenge tomorrow, you will have uh, the description about oh how do I build? Because you your exercise is to build catalog application, which is a Python app. I'll add the similar instructions here, and then there will be a voting application, which is a Spring Boot Java-based application. Again, you can look at the form.xml and see that, hey, I have to use Maven here. So if you know about this and you've built it a few times, you'll definitely be able to figure out. It's not uh, too complex, to be uh, to be honest, right? And uh, uh, this is about how do we start optimizing the image. And then there are further things that you can add. I'm gonna show you an example of that. For example, for front end, I have a uh, have a Docker file here. Now, what else do I have here, and what is good to have? Now, this has a lot of uh, um, comments and everything as well to help you understand what is happening. So, you see, this is a multi-stage Docker file. We start with from Node latest. This is a Debian-based image, and then you add a work directory, copy the file that you need, run npm install. And then you start with the second stage. The second stage is where we take a smaller image, Node Alpine. Uh, now, some best practices, apart from what we discussed, uh, another best practice is to run the application or configure the application to be run as a non-root user. Why this is useful is because this is more of a security enhancement so that uh, even if something is mounted accidentally or otherwise on your container, uh, you're not accidentally writing to that underlying system and changing it and modifying it. So you can control that if you're running your application as a non-root user. When you go to Kubernetes, you can also make this as a mandate that, oh, if the image is running as a root, do not run it at all, right? So you can make that as a policy as well. So you can enforce it from Kubernetes. And uh, that's a good practice. If you use OpenShift, that is enforced or enabled by default. So if you start using OpenShift and you, your images, not, images are not working, uh, the containers are not launching, you know what's the problem. It's running as a root. So you're using a non-root user. So what do you need to do? You have to create a user. And then you use a user statement so that everything from there on runs as dot .user, including the application itself. <coughs> okay. Uh, John has a question about what about Jenkins here? So can you elaborate on that question? What do you mean by Jenkins? Uh, are you talking about a Jenkins image? Are you talking about Jenkins CI? Uh, integration with that, what is the question? So I would like to understand the question first. Uh, what is a distro-less image? Distro-less image is typically, I believe, there is a concept of, uh, uh, there was a micro kernel and uh, distros are basically your um, Debian, Alpine, right? Uh, CentOS, Red Hat, uh, all of those are 
uh, you know, kind of um, uh, based on some distribution of Linux, like Alpine and Debian and all that. These are general purpose operating system. The distroless images are typically catering to a particular application and it does not have a typical operating system environment at all. Uh, I had learned about this concept somewhere earlier uh, and in the form of a unikernel. Again, unikernels are a similar concept. I believe it's a similar concept there. So distroless is very language focused and it only contains how you run a particular application with a Node.js, right? And maybe the environment required for that. So basically you are getting rid of everything that you don't need and you just have the actual application runtime and somehow a way to do that. Maybe it is uni it's a parallel concept to Unicana, but that's what I see uh, being here. So distroless is basically a very tiny image, even tinier than Alpine. So that's something you can use to further optimize it. And maybe I'll do a, a YouTube video on distroless images and uh, share it uh, with the community, right? How to use it, uh, what is the difference it makes. And it will be very specific though. So you can only see that it has, uh, uh, you know, it has a specific architecture it runs on and uh, it works with a particular like Python 3 or Java or Java 17 or Node.js 18. So a very specific environment to run Node.js application. This might be uh, an idea that you can try out as well. That's a distroless image. Anything which doesn't belong to any distribution or doesn't have any distribution. Um, okay, so John's question is how can we implement the build using Jenkins? So once you have figured out the Docker file, uh, when we talk about the mission number four, where we come back and talk about building pipelines with Jenkins, uh, we will look at that. So how do we integrate this? So we have written the Docker file, we have committed those. Next, we're gonna add some branching models and use trunk-based development model policy, use pull request-based workflows, uh, code reviews and all of that. So we're gonna implement all these good practices and then we come back and integrate this very same thing that we did with Jenkins, where we create a pipeline, we create a multi-branch pipeline, we integrate with Docker. So all of that uh, we will look at when we get to the pipeline end as a uh, mission. Uh, so one week after this, so this is uh, uh, containerized, and then we talk about Gitify, then we come back for pipeline end. That's what we do. So when we go to pipeline end, we will explicitly have a session on that. All right, so uh, another thing that I want to mention here is the health check. This is a good practice. Again, why to add a health check? Why not? I mean, uh, whether the app container or application is actually running or not. And based on that, the restart policies can come in. So restart policies will automatically restart the container, even in Kubernetes, you know, uh, whether the container is alive or ready or not, uh, that is defined with the health check if you have defined it. Why to define it? Uh, is because sometimes what happens is container is running, application is running, but it is hung. It is not responding. How do you figure these kind of situations is using adding your specific health checks. You can say that, oh, uh, check this port if the application returns the 200 status or not. Uh, based on that, it will basically uh, decide whether the application is running or not and whether it needs to be restarted and uh, whatnot, right? That's the health check part. So adding a health check is a good practice. Uh, adding users is a good practice. Using multi-stage Docker file is gonna help you optimize. Using a small base image for your final uh, you know, image, that's gonna help you optimize as well. And when you say multi-stage Docker file, it is not limited to just two stages. Sometimes you'll see more than one, more than two also. Let me see if I have an example of that. So it's part of my Docker stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So all of this documentation is part of my courses, labs. I use bear to write it. And uh, yeah, over the years, this is the kind of writing I have. Uh, labs too. Yeah. So when we talk about container based uh, Docker file, right? Multi-stage Docker builds. So it can be more than two. You can see here we have three stages from as build there is a test stage and then there is a run stage now this is where this uh, adds whatever the tag we have can come into play so you can say oh i want to build it with a particular target this is called as a target 
target can be run target can be test so when you have a ci job and one ci job with one docker file with three ci jobs like you have build and test and package uh, in the test job you can create an image till here only and when you run it you see the command is going to be clean test so if you just want to run this via container just the test job uh, you can say target is equal to test and it only runs that much right versus if you don't provide any target it's going to go all the way and execute everything here that is how it is right that's how uh, it is done so you can have multiple stages as in uh, not just two could be three four whatever and based on that when you run it normally it builds all but if you have a specific uh, requirement you can just say oh same docker file but i want to run uh, or build just for testing and uh, you can do that uh, with multi-stage docker file like this this is an example of uh, generally you will see two stage ones but uh, this is a good example of if i want to use multiple stages like more than two as well and uh, that is uh, what it is uh, now, if you um, are a member, I'm going to add the project to our, uh, you know, you'll find it in the challenges. So just follow the challenge from here. Everything is right here. The containerize uh, is what we are talking about now. I have already added the prerequisite course material, which takes you to the Docker. So if you want to follow and confused how to get started, just follow this. And you can see that all the lessons related to that are here like how do you write, build an image, how do you write docker file, etc. Even advanced concepts are there. So advanced concept, I said, uh, you can use it as a bonus, like multi-stage docker files and stuff. But at least building docker images, you should know about and learn this uh, and then uh, go through this live session to understand how you will do it for uh, these two applications. And as part of your project, your exercise, I'm going to give you, and it will be added here itself, along with maybe a quiz, uh, so give me a day or so, I will add rest of the things. And uh, this is where you'll add uh, two projects here. This is the older project, but I'm gonna add newer ones and uh, update it uh, over the email to you, right? And there you will build uh, the catalog and the voting service. One is a Python application, second is a Java application. Very straightforward, very simple um, for you to build. And at the end of this week, Basically, you should have uh, a containerized um, all the all the four applications, and you should have images built for all four, right? And uh, that is the idea. And using that, you can launch it and test it as well. If you have all four running, if they are linked together using like Docker Compose or some sort of a linking a linking option, uh, you are going to see an application like this. Basically, a complete application. You start with the front end, and then you reach to here after uh, you have created this. Uh, that is about it for this week. This week I wanted to talk about how to, uh, the art of writing Docker file, how to write one. I showed you how to write it from scratch. We talked about multi-stage Docker file. We, sh we learned how to take an image from like, let's say 560 MB uh, down to less than 25. And uh, what are the techniques we can use like multi-stage Docker files, smaller images, uh, and best practices like using user instruction. Uh, following health checks and uh, those kind of things as well. And I showed you an example of a, even a three-stage Docker file as well. Uh, any final questions here? All right, Udit has a question. Um, okay, it's a longer question. I'm just gonna go through it. Uh, I have a Docker file and when I try to build the Docker image via Jenkins pipeline, it hangs the Jenkins server what can be the possible issue? My Docker file is, um, okay, this is not very visible. I would recommend Udit, uh, you create a Docker file using gist. If you have a GitHub account, use gist.github.com, paste your code here. And uh, uh, let me see, this is not very visible, right? And uh, paste your code here and do that, right? Now, uh, there could be many issues. Uh, we also need to look at how you have configured Jenkins with Docker um, and so on. So maybe it's not a problem with Docker file at all, right? Uh, so depends on that. So try using this Docker file that you have pasted is a problem only if something else is running. Let's take another application, see if that works, right? If something else is running and this not, uh, then we look at the Docker file here, right? Only then. 
Uh, before that though, see if a simple Docker file works or not, right? So that's what I would suggest you do. And how you have configured it, you'll have to figure out also, right? So does it run a job with a Docker agent uh, initially? Uh, how we have configured it and all that, right? So we'll have to look into all of this to actually answer this. But my suggestion is you try using another Docker file. And then if that is not working here, uh, you can also connect with uh, with me on Thursday evening. Thursday evening, we have uh, uh, a Zoom call typically where I take more questions, interactive question over Zoom call, and uh, we can discuss this there if you're a member. Uh, if not, uh, we have a session uh, on Pipeline it where we'll be talking about Jenkins and Docker in integration. Go through that also, and that may already have fixed most of your issues. If not, we'll look into that uh, as well, right? Uh, so, but give this a try before you come and uh, uh, ask the further questions so that you, we know that, oh, uh, something is working and this is not. If that is not working, then you figure out why, right? Maybe the integration is a problem. Uh, maybe something else is a problem. Uh, what I can give you is in the meanwhile is my code, uh, which will mostly work. This comes with Docker integration already. No, I, I'll have to figure out where that code is. Uh, based on that, I'll have to share it with you. Or let me do that here if I can quickly. Yeah, get remote show origin. Yeah, this one. So uh, try using this environment. See if this works for you. Because this is the one uh, I have tested this. It worked as of last week and most of the Jenkins Docker files worked as well. If there is a specific issue, we'll have to look into it. But use Docker Compose to launch a Jenkins environment with uh, something called as DIND, Docker Inside Docker. And this is well integrated. It's already integrated. So use Docker Compose to launch it and then uh, see if that works. If it doesn't, we'll figure it out. That's the next step for you at least. Uh, if this is not working, then we have to look at a Docker file. So I would appreciate if you can just convert it into a, a readable code and we could look into it. If it is very heavy, uh, maybe that is the issue. Maybe it requires more memory, uh, things like that. Uh, I will also try this if you share the code properly. I will also try it in my environment and see if it works for me or not. And we can troubleshoot based on that. Um, also, I would recommend you to come up, uh, you know, come into our Thursday evening session so that we can take up these topics as well. Uh, questions like this too. All right, so that's pretty much what we wanted to cover. Uh, for this mission of the 90 Day DevOps Challenge. I hope you are enjoying and benefiting out of this. Uh, let me share, finally, let me share. For those of you who are not members, you can, uh, last time you asked for assignment, your assignment is to uh, build the image for uh, these two applications, voting and uh, catalog, and go through what I've gone through here and front end and recommendations. Try to fix that recommendation service as well. And it's the same code. So we're gonna continue doing the same thing so it's the same application uh, that you're going to build the images for and uh, it's the same app so just bookmark it and uh, i'm updating this constantly you can see a lot of bug fixes i've gone through uh, over the weekend i have worked on it extensively uh, this is in a very good state right now uh, my voting app was in had a problem the status apps had, there's small small bugs were there uh, most of those have been ironed out the next thing that I'm going to do is, uh, uh, you know, add the instructions for you to build each of this application. That should be sufficient for uh, this week's homework for you. And next week, you go through the Git course to prepare for the next week. You go through the Git Essentials course and you come back for the next week. And I'll demonstrate a few more things with Git. And then we'll be onward to the next topic from there. All right. So that's uh, about that. Yeah. And I think uh, Udit has shared the GitHub link. I'm gonna look at that.
copy link. Let's see if we can review quickly. If not, I'll have to take uh, for the later. So this is the code. And uh, all right. So to do application deployment, uh, what is this application? It's a Python application. Great. Uh, there is a Python code at least that I see. That's Selenium. I think it's running some Selenium tests. GitHub, CICD pipeline is Jenkins. Fine, 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 fine. Uh, test environment is with Selenium. Maybe that requires a lot of memory. That's probably not as work, not working. Uh, and you have a Docker file, which is here. So Python, okay, this is starts with Python. And then uh, run PyTest, install Selenium. Flask run, Flask is very simple. So Flask should just run. Uh, let me see if we can build it. Python Flask is a very tiny, uh, I mean, it's a very optimized version. It's not too heavy either. So if it is not working, we'll have to figure out. Uh, let's at least see if this works, builds. So to do application, good thing about Docker file and the code is uh, you can do this. I have a code, I can build it. So I just say Docker image build hyphen T. And then uh, let's say uh, to do application. So to do v1. I should be able to build it. If I can build it from here, my idea is it should work from Jenkins, but we will look into it if this is not working. And now that I have your application with it, I will give this a try for sure. And this works and let me just run it and see run hyphen IDTP. Docker PS minus L it's running three to seven seven two. Docker logs minus L. Yeah, came upon 5000 port. That's what is mapped to three to seven seven two. So if I use that here yep it uh, does work and uh, okay task one yeah that's good sleep for eight hours or seven hours that's in my to-do list here yeah. works 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 all right, so I will check on this, why, uh, if it works on my environment or not, and I'll uh, report to you. Uh, but uh, this seems like a um, kind of a straightforward build and application. Um, so it should work in my opinion, but we will have to check why and if it is not. That's that folks. So any final questions here for me? All right. So thank you for attending today's session, the masterclass number two, and uh, we will continue building. We'll do most interesting stuff. The application itself is quite interesting. So if you build this entire application, implement all of these practices, you will not only learn a lot, but it will definitely help you in your career to progress from here. And it's not just a Hello World app. It has a lot of interesting features. It has actual tests. Uh, you can extend it. I have also added a support for Postgres now. So this architecture is going to change a little bit and Postgres goes here and uh, maybe Mongo here or something. So I'm modifying that and uh, uh, you learn a full relevant technologies in the world of DevOps and SRE in general. And uh, that's why you should continue uh, with the, you know, with this challenge and go all the way through it. I hope this session was useful for you. So thank you. And I will see you uh, next week.
Thank you and bye-bye. All the best with the 90-day challenge. That's it, folks. Thank you.